Okay, good afternoon. Welcome to Medical Grand Rounds. This will actually be our last Grand Rounds of this academic year. So uh, enjoy your time on Thursdays at noon for the next several months. And then when we come back in September, we will be on Tuesdays at noon in a room TBD. We still haven't figured out where we are because this building will either be torn down or be in the process of being torn down uh, in, in the fall somewhere, somewhere on campus. Uh, and we'll continue to be hybrid. So if folks wanna watch virtually, as a uh, majority of our folks do, they will be able to do that. Uh, today, it seems appropriate for the last uh, grand rounds of the academic year to focus on uh, respiratory viruses with a little bit on COVID and what's happening with COVID. Seems like we're in something between an uptick and a surge. Uh, and we'll hear from some of our experts about where we are and where we're likely to go and some of the strategies uh, to, to deal with that. We also have a new form of influenza uh, that we, everyone is talking about and con is confusing. So we'll talk about that. And we'll also talk about some of the other uh, viral threats that are, uh, are out there, including uh, measles and uh, mpox and a few other things. So to do that, uh, we have a, a spectacular panel of experts. I will introduce all of them, but the way we'll do it is the first speaker, who is George Rutherford, will come up and give his very familiar uh, talk on kind of the state of uh, the pandemics, but on this one, it will be uh, COVID and, and, uh, and bird flu mostly. And then we'll have uh, George joined by three other experts and we'll spend the rest of our time in a panel discussion, uh, which I will lead and then we'll open it up for questions in about, uh, about 10 to 15 minutes uh, before the hour. So uh, briefly, uh, our uh, four speakers are George Rutherford, who's I think familiar to all of you. He is professor in epidemiology, preventive medicine, pediatrics, and history. Uh, he's also director of the Center for Global Strategic Information, Public Health Practice in our Institute for Global Health Sciences. Uh, George is a world expert on epidemiology of infectious disease and throughout the pandemic was really our go-to person to tell us about the state of the uh, pandemic. And so uh, look forward to hearing his comments. So George will come up first, and then uh, he will be joined by our three other panelists. Uh, first will be Peter Chin Hung, Peter's Professor of Medicine and Associate Dean for Regional Campuses uh, for the School of Medicine. Uh, Peter is uh, an infectious disease expert whose career is focused on the care of patients uh, who are immunocompromised, uh, but also uh, became a, a go-to expert on uh, all things COVID during the uh, pandemic with I had hundreds or thousands of appearances in the media, somewhere between hundreds and thousands of appearances in the media. Uh, Peter's a terrific educator, both of the public and of, uh, of our trainees. He's won uh, almost every educational award we have to bestow, including the Kaiser Award for Excellence in Teaching, the core teaching awards from several medical school classes, and he was the commencement speaker for the UCSF School of Medicine class of 2015. He was awarded the Carl Sagan Science Popularization Prize for 2022 for his communication during COVID. Uh, next is uh, Debbie Okoe, who is professor of medicine, also in our division of infectious disease based here at UCSF Health. Uh, she is the medical director for hospital epidemiology and infection prevention. Uh, she also attends on the transplant ID consult services uh, Deb is not only uh, an expert and a go-to leader here for uh, uh, our strategies around combating infectious disease, for which she was essential during COVID, uh, but she also has a number of national leadership roles and recently stepped down as the president for the Society uh, for Healthcare Epidemiology of America, the major society of infectious disease epidemiologists in the country. And uh, uh, last and not least is Allison Bond, who is assistant professor of medicine uh, she's a clinician educator who has a dual life in our division of hospital medicine and also in our division of infectious disease. She's a trained ID doctor uh, who also attends on, on the medical service. Uh, she is a, a professionally trained science writer uh, on the side with uh, publications in uh, the New York Times, Boston Globe, uh, The Atlantic. Uh, she continues to write for the popular uh, lay media as well as uh, uh, in medicine. So uh, a really interesting diverse group of people to help update us on the state of various infections. And so we will start off with George. Thank you, Dr. Walker. It's always a pleasure to be back. Um, I thought I'd start off with a quick, some quick overviews of what's going on with, uh, with COVID. As you know, COVID is 
Well, it is a reportable disease. It sort of, you know, really isn't a reportable disease because everybody tests themselves at home and nobody reports anything. So we're left with other having to put together other ways to figure out trends in COVID. This is emergency department uh, visits for COVID, RSV, and for influenza in California. Uh, what you can see is is that uh, we had, uh, you know, the, got a lot, a lot of activity um, in uh, the winter of 22-23, um, somewhat less so in the winter of 23-24. The top line is the summative one. And uh, now there's a drop off with maybe, 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 maybe kind of an uptick, um, which is predominantly uh, due to, to COVID. We'll get more to that. The other great system we have, we also look at deaths and, and hospitalizations, which I'll show you those data. We also do wastewater surveillance. Wastewater is very, very, a very good surveillance system. It was originally put together for polio surveillance and during in polio eradication areas. Um, but it, you can see that it's that it is a trending upwards in that green and that with the jump there is in the is in the west, and a lot of that is in California. This is looking at the concentration of viral particles per whatever of uh, per cubic volume of, of, of wastewater. And because this is not a very much of an epizootic disease, although pets can get it, this is largely human waste stream that you're, that you're seeing. And it's an early warning sign, um, which is often followed by uh, increases in, in ER visits and then hospitalization. So something to pay attention to, as you can see, we're, we're you know, reading tea leaves here with sort of a 10 percent ish of the of the of the of the uh, max peaks. Um, hospitalizations are here on the left. Uh, this is also California. These are also California data. You can see there has been an increase. Um, and that's uh, largely in northern California. And a lot of that's in the Bay Area. Uh, why is it going up in the Bay Area? Who knows? Um, but, the, but it goes with the wastewater surveillance. It seems like it is going up and I'll be interested to hear um, from, our, uh, from the other speakers about what they're seeing in the, uh, in the hospitals. Uh, deaths, however, are at a very, very low, uh, uh, are very, very low in the state and uh, even, in fact, around the country. Um, as you know, COVID loves to, as viruses do or want to do, loves to mutate. Uh, we're currently dealing primarily with two variants called KP2 and KP3. Uh, they're part of the JN1 lineage, which is the darker purple. Um, the, what, the, what the interesting part here is that the FDA panel on what goes into the, in, 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 to the influenza viruses also is now looking at COVID viruses. And last week they voted to put in the JN1 uh, lineage, which is kind of yesterday's news. Right, but these others are so closely related. It seems that they get a, a, a twofer or a threefer out of it. They can revisit it again and, and put together a bivalent vaccine. But right now, the production is gearing up uh, for the mRNA vaccines for the for a J and one predominant vaccine. If you're uh, if you're eligible, if you should be getting the uh, a second COVID shot this uh, this spring, by all means, uh, get it. Now, moving on to flu. Um, Influenza A is a disease of waterfowl. It spreads by accident into other uh, species, mammals and uh, other avian species. Um, and chickens seem to be very susceptible, mostly because they can't, you know, they don't fly around too much. For those of you who've been around chickens. Um, but we thought it was, it was, this all started back in 1997, kind of this current outbreak. Uh, and it's been a slow, mo uh, slow moving uh, epizootic um, that's spread around the world. What we're seeing here in California is that we're seeing detections in backyard uh, uh, poultry. People have chickens in their backyard, not a good idea. Uh, and uh, also in commercial breeding farms, commercial breeding farms, this is an existential threat. Everybody's well one day, everybody's dead the next day in, 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 in their chicken farms. So this is a big, big deal uh, for commercial chicken farmers. But it also is a marker of how much is being, how much is the spread. So there's the, you see parallel things for wild birds. 
but it also can spread from birds to mammals. Uh, what we haven't seen much of is mammal to mammal transmission. What we have seen is a lot of bird to mammal transmission. These are the animals like cats and stuff who catch birds who are wounded, right? Or dying or you know down on the ground. Um, but it's a lot of sort of smaller mammals. Uh, yes, yes, there's a polar bear on here. I'll give you that. But the, uh, yeah, there's a lot of smaller mammals uh, that would, you know, that you could imagine, you know, as they capture these uh, captured birds, wild birds who are dying of influenza could easily get, uh, pick up the disease. Now, having said that, there are two vicious counterexamples to this. One is that there's an outbreak in dairy cattle now, which clearly involves cow to cow transmission. Uh, it probably started in Texas. Uh, and then because these animals get shuffled around a lot, um, spread across the Midwest and is now in something like nine states, not one, California is not one of them. The other vicious counterexample, and this is something I think is, that's really gives you pause. And this could seem utterly exotic and sort of esoteric. And why are we talking about this at, a, at the hospital? Is in uh, elephant seal pups and elephant seals off the coast of Argentina, there's been 96% mortality in, among newborns, all with, as he coughs, right, on cue, uh, on uh, 96 mortality, 6% 6 mortality among, among newborns with H5N1, and it's clearly being transmitted from animal to animal. There's also a parallel outbreak in, in sea lions that mix with these, with these rookeries. Uh, so, we do have examples of mammal to mammal transmission. In terms of humans, there have been four cases in the United States. There have been about a thousand cases worldwide going back to 1997 with about a 50% case fatality rate. Uh, a lot of these, have, they all involve people who are very kind of directly in contact with these animals. There may be two cases of human to human transmission, very unclear, not well investigated. Um, and the, They've been doing cluster investigations around these cases, these handful of cases of human transmission, bird to human or cow to human transmission have not found any secondary transmission. So that's uh, uh, good news. Uh, of these four cases, one was in Colorado and it was a guy who was, whose job it was to cull chickens, basically wade into the flock and, and um, kill them. Um, and, uh, and the other three were people who are very directly involved uh, with dairy cattle. Um, diseases, the, the symptoms are pretty mild. Um, three of them only had conjunctivitis. There was a fourth that also, the fourth uh, most recent case also had a cough. But, okay, so this, you can take this for what it's worth. But what we do know is that, you know, there has been mammal to mammal transmission, right? This is something to worry about. So how to protect your um, your family, uh, avoid exposure to sick or dead animals, including wild birds, poultry, and other domesticated birds, and other wild or domesticated animals, uh, if possible. Now, what does that mean if you have, anybody here have chickens in their backyard? Good, I don't have to yell at you. If you have chickens in your backyard and they start to die, don't go out and try and resuscitate them, you know, okay? Let them go. I'm, I'm serious. Uh, and, um, you know, you want to avoid um, exposure to Littler, uh, yeah, to Gene Littler, the golfer. Uh, avoid exposure to animal feces, litter, unpasteurized milk or materials that have been touched by or close to birds or other animals. You could potassium, possibly have H5N1. There's, there are very high levels in, in milk. And the predominant symptom is in dairy cows is, as we say in pediatrics, galactopenia. Uh, decreased milk flow. Um, avoid drinking raw milk. This is not going to go down well in parts of the country, um, but this is something, this is yet another reason to pasteurize your, your milk. Um, poultry cooked, uh, properly handled and cooked poultry is safe in the U.S. But handled is, is about salmonella risk. It's not about influenza risk. And then there are very specific guidance that's going out to people who interact with, uh, with these animals. So what kind of risk does it pose to human health at the moment? Not a lot, unless you're at occupational risk. 
uh, reports of human to human transmission are exceedingly rare. They're from kind of early, the late 1990s. Um, however, there is this concern that a series of mutations, and there's a lot of this stuff circulating now, uh, could make it more tropic for human respiratory cells. There are 100,000 people employed in the dairy cattle industry. We should be vaccinating them in all likelihood. However, 80% of the vaccine is grown in eggs. This kills eggs as well as chickens. Uh, so you're gonna have to use cell culture, uh, which the Chinese have kind of a, have pioneered. We don't have a lot of it in the US, but it's something I think that uh, we'll see more of. You have to do surveillance testing uh, and, then, um, and then wastewater uh, testing. It's, when it comes off of farms, it's unclear where it all comes from. Uh, it can actually come out of the fields as well. So I'll stop there and look forward to hearing my colleagues' insights. Great, thank you. Can we bring uh, everybody up? Thank you, thank you, Drew. <laughs> you can be anytime you want, anytime you want. Uh, Okay, why don't we just uh, start with everybody else's reaction to what you just heard, anything particularly scary or particularly interesting to you as you uh, think about, uh, maybe start with, start with COVID and then we'll turn to influenza. Peter, what, what, what strikes you about the current moment in COVID? I think the most striking thing to me in COVID is the low vaccination rate, particularly in seniors. So nationally it's about 40 something percent, but California is actually trailing the country in, vaccination of seniors, but the Bay Area may be running about 50 to 60%. But uh, when you look at seniors of color, it's even lower, like 22% Latinx populations, meaning to say that we had a lot of efforts in the beginning of the pandemic for vaccine equity, but it's kind of fallen off. And, you know, I was in the hospital for the last few weeks, a few weeks uh, over the last few months, and pretty much a few, I saw a handful of people who were very sick with COVID and not a single one of them uh, had gotten the recent booster. And when you say vaccination rate, are you referring to the second yeah. six month one? Or no, are you no, referring that's to the first one. That's the, the one, of, the one since, of the past, in the yeah. past year. They haven't the, gotten one in the past year. The fall, of, yeah, October of 2023. And George recommended that, that people do, people who are eligible, which I guess is over 65, get the second one. Uh, are you on board with that? Yes, totally, because um, I think we're going to see a continued increase in COVID in the community in the Bay Area and, and California and the country. And if you think about when you, people ask, always ask that question, when should you get the vaccine in the fall? And you don't want to get it too early. You don't want to get it too late. It's kind of like goalie locks. So if the uh, vulnerable uh, populations get that vaccine now for the summer, you can still get it around you know, Halloween, which will be well-timed in general for winter okay. with flu. Great. Alison, what strikes you from what you heard? Um, I think one of the big points that jump forward, not just related to COVID, but also related to the, the risk of uh, H5N1 is sort of how politicized um, science and, you know, public health recommendations have become and how that does pose um, an ongoing risk to the public, um, not just you know, with regards to COVID vaccines, that's definitely a, a huge issue, but also, you know, George brought up the, the pasteurized milk and how that's now a hot button topic. Um, so I think that's really dangerous. And there's a big question about sort of where we where we go from here um, to serve the public's best interests. So um, that was the, the big thing that jumped can, out. Can you, uh, this is sort of the first I've heard of the politics of unpasteurized milk. So what, what's your, what is, what are the politics of unpasteurized milk? Um, well, from what I understand, I mean, certainly from an infectious disease standpoint, we would recommend against drinking unpasteurized milk, um, just because it can carry a number of types of infections, um, including, you know, the, the one that we were just talking about. Um, but in certain circles, I think it's become um, sort of a, a hot button topic because it represents, you know, uh, to some people, government overreach um, in terms of like, telling people what to do and not letting people have freedom of choice. Um, and unfortunately, you know, that becomes a public health issue sometimes. And, and I also worry, um, and this kind of gets back to media coverage of, of uh, infectious diseases and things like that, sort of if the understanding is necessarily there um, among some people who 
choose to drink unpasteurized milk, um, you know, where they're getting their information in terms of if it's from TikTok or Instagram saying this is actually pretty safe to drink. And so um, I just want to emphasize that some of the, I think many of the people who are maybe doing some of these practices are, are actually um, vulnerable themselves. Um, and one of the questions is sort of like how to get the right information to them in a way that they're receptive to. And maybe back either any of you on this, uh, I'm not quite sure I heard George, has there been a case of, of a person getting influenza from unpasteurized milk or it's just a theoretical concern? It's a theoretical concern, okay. Yeah, go, go ahead, you wanna, anything you wanna add to that or just that's right now it's a theoretical concern, but, and why, why would it be a concern when, at least I always thought influenza was a respiratory virus and you wouldn't be able to get it from drinking something? It's not a respiratory virus in birds. It's, it causes, it's, it's transmitted, it's fecal oral transmission. Huh. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we do know that the, um, uh, the udders are an end organ in cattle and because it does cause decreased milk production and there's not, it's not beyond, you know, uh, not beyond the possibility that it, that's because there's virus there. Now they don't kill these guys. These are expensive cattle. Um, but it's, you know, it's a, this is a real concern. A lot of the, a lot of the infection from, uh, so in Cal, I don't really, really want to get into this. In California, there are probably about seven raw milk dairies. Six of them are for goats, and they have the names of the goats over their stalls. You know, they have six goats here and there. Then there's one in Riverside County with 50,000 or so go cattle in it. Um, and that's for milk, milk, cow milk. Um, and the cows walk in the wintertime. They're utter deep in, you know, in mud and stuff. So there, a lot of this is external as well as internal. Uh, and... You know, the big concern here is Salmonella Dublin I, uh, which can, which will kill you if you're of a certain vintage. Um, and it's, you know, and that's actually excreted in the milk. And when this stuff's not pasteurized, you know, this is mass produced, it's distributed widely. So it sounds like you think unpasteurized milk is just a bad idea in general. And this is a good time to warn people about it. it's not necessarily that this, that people are going to catch it from, catch the new influenza from the milk. Is that? You're not sure yet. I can add one yeah. nugget to that, and people might have seen the, you know, the investigation that found molecular fragments of H5N1 in one of five samples in the U.S. in milk, and that's pasteurized milk. So it's just a statistical game, I think. At some point, you may encounter admixed milk, although the raw milk uh, purveyors say they come from single farms, etc. But you still may get accidentally uh, a sick cow's milk with the others and in the right host, uh, you can get serious ill, serious Ill. But like George said, I think from an ID perspective, the biggest threat is uh, Salmonella and like Allison said, Listeria and E. coli, because Salmonella lives in the gut of, the, of birds and dairy as well. Uh, and that can just get into the wrong person, the wrong place. Okay. And just to be clear, one in five samples of pasteurized milk find fragments, but the, but it still should be safe. Yeah, those it's still safe because virus. they actually took those fragments and injected it into, um, they tried to culture it out and mm -hmm. they were dead. Got it. They went alive. Got it. Uh, Debbie, how are you seeing all of this, maybe with a particular spin on how it's affecting your thinking about our policies here? Sure. Um, first of all, I want to say that I agree with everything that um, um, George and, and Peter and, and Allison said, um, the fact that so many aspects of, of infectious diseases, public health are now, now politicized, it's, it's been very, very challenging. Um, I also wanted to emphasize the importance of vaccination that, that Peter brought up. Um, it's, it's one of the major layers of protection that we have against a variety of different infectious diseases. So certainly, um, true for COVID-19, important to get um, immunized um, and be up to date on your immunizations. Um, there's a lot of data that shows that our, our immunity wanes over time after getting immunized and after natural infection. So it's really important to get, um, be up to date. Um, also true for MPOX, which George didn't talk a lot about, but um, just um, there was a lot of uptake of the Genios vaccine um, back in 2022, and we're seeing many cases, but that's really fallen off a lot. Um, and although the number of cases has fallen off, it's never gone to zero in, in the US. Mm -hmm. We keep seeing clusters of, of MPOX infections are so really important to, 
to make sure that your patients who are at risk for MPOX are getting the full two dose um, uh, Genios vaccine series. And patients who are at risk are who? Patients are at risk um, according to the ACIP. And hold the mic a little closer. Yeah, patients are at risk according to the ACIP recommendations are um, cisgender, bi gender, transgender men or and other men who have sex with men um, and have at least one of a variety of risk factors within the past six months um, that um, include at least one sexually transmitted infection. Um, multiple sexual partners and some other risk factors or people who have um, sex with those individuals. Okay. Um, it's actually included now in the ACIP routine adult immunization schedule. So in addition to being recommended, it's, it's paid for by Medicare, Medicaid, and will probably be paid for by commercial um, health insurance as well. Okay, let's turn back to COVID for a sec. So part of your role is to think about the policies that we have in an organization. And if, you know, in the last year, we've gone away from universal masking requirements, we've gone away from routine testing of people, um, all of our vaccine sites have gone away. So as we look at that, at the Georgia's curve, where there's at least an uptick in COVID, are we, should we be rethinking any of those decisions now, or do you think they're still the correct decisions for now? So it's a great question. Um, I think COVID is with us for the foreseeable future, along with all of these other respiratory infections that we've been talking about. So whatever strategies we come up with have to be sustainable over time. And so it's always a balance of benefits and, and downsides to any strategies that we put into place. I think it makes sense to make the changes that we have made recently, um, but also be thinking forward um, and, and um, knowing that we will see these surges um, appear periodically over time. So um, around COVID and, and masking, um, Michelle Marad, who's in the audience and, um, and others have been working hard to create a um, UCSF health-wide policy to, to think about the, the, the benefits and the downsides, but also be proactive. Um, and so that policy will include um, mandatory masking during um, uh, respiratory viral season. So, so thinking not only about COVID-19, but also influenza and RSV and, and other community respiratory viruses. Um, so mandatory masking probably between November and April of each year, um, plus um, mandatory masking potentially during other time periods where we're seeing unusually high um, viral activity in the community. And we're we've worked hard to come up with some parameters that are reasonable. So it'll probably be based on um, the percentage of influenza like illness visits in, in um, outpatient settings. Mm -hmm. That's all data that's collected through a large network of outpatient providers and, and available on the CDC website. So, and we can look specifically at our region of the country. So we'll be setting our parameters based on higher than anticipated levels. So, so we will always, so in the winter and flu season, we can expect that it will be mandatory masking and in other parts of the year, it will be dependent on the level of influenza-like activity that we're seeing largely in outpatient settings. That's exactly right. That's the proposal. And how close or far are we from that now, given the uptick in COVID that, uh, that we're seeing? We're still under the baseline. So the parameters that we had said was about if we exceeded one and a half standard deviations above that baseline for a sustained period of time. And I think we said two consecutive weeks. That's when we would consider uh, reinstituting masking. So we're, we're certainly below that now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, all right, let's come back the other way, Allison. Um, it strikes me that over the last however many decades, there's an infectious threat that pops up every couple of years. And there's a little bit of sort of some people, a lot of complacency, some people, a little bit of panic. And I'd say for most of them, they have not lived up to their advanced billing, maybe except for COVID, certainly, certainly except for COVID. Um, how do you think uh, sort of looking at the way we are reacting to, uh, to the new, uh, the bird flu uh, outbreak, how different is that than what would, have, what would have happened if that outbreak had happened in 2019? And do you think 
think the fact that we're paying more attention to it now maybe is is as appropriate that we were under we were underemphasizing these things in the past because there's always the risk that we're going to overemphasize them. People are going to say, you know, you cried, cried wolf again, and it didn't turn out to be a big deal. Yeah, um, I think that coverage definitely, um, you know, of H5N1 is different than, um, you know, infectious disease coverage before COVID. Um, for one thing, I think there's um, generally more of a widespread interest in sort of the intricacies of how we monitor infectious disease, how we're testing. Um, and I think there's um, more attention as well, like in the media with regards to um, showing the public kind of every step of the way. For example, all the examples that we've talked about between, you know, animal to animal um, transmission, for example, um, you know, I don't know that in that level of detail, um, it would have been so widely publicized. I think we would have been talking about it probably um, in the infectious disease and public health worlds, but um, maybe not so much public interest. Um, and certainly there is, um, you know, COVID fatigue and in, in terms of people, as you mentioned, saying, well, there's always something, you know, why should I be worried? And um, I think at the same time, um, people have seen how much of an effect uh, a, a pandemic can have on your life. Um, and, you know, people have seen the real world impacts um, of like needing to wear a mask, but bigger than that, you know, the more widespread mortality, millions of people have had some symptoms of long COVID. So I think that um, it's COVID has made the threat of infections very real to people. Um, and so I think that that's, um, there's people are paying a little more attention with that regard. Mm -hmm. um, okay, Peter, let's talk about long COVID for a second. It hasn't come up yet. We know more about it now than we did a year or two ago. And what do you, how do you see the current state of long COVID? Are there any treatments available now that we've learned more about it? What's, what do we know about the pathophysiology? Well, I think the biggest news about long COVID in the last week or so has been disappointing news from the Stanford study so called Stop COVID, where they tried to see if people with long COVID and the whole host of symptoms would benefit from 15 days of Paxlovid. So they did like a two to one randomization of people with long COVID symptoms and people with not, uh, uh, with who weren't going to get Paxlovid. And it was uh, a small study, so like 100 in one group and 50 in the other, but it showed no uh, benefit of Paxlovid for 15 days, um, you know, when looked at it a few weeks later. Um, and a lot of people were disappointed because there had been anecdotal reports of success with Paxlovid. So that's kind of where we are with long COVID. Um, no good diagnostic test still yet, but uh, just a few days ago, the um, National Association of Medicine uh, and several people at UCSF are in that organization um, had made a definition of long COVID, which is meant to be more expansive and more equitable because the whole, um, uh, what was observed was that people who didn't get a diagnostic test in the beginning uh, weren't able to call what they had long COVID, so they weren't eligible to for benefits. So right now they made it much more umbrella-like uh, with a whole host of 20, 200 symptoms. Uh, didn't give a time when it starts, um, but it lasts you know, beyond three months. Uh, and um, it's meant to be the beginning of a conversation. So I think we're still in the infancy of long COVID. Probably why the Stanford study didn't work is because long COVID is probably a bunch of different things in that syndrome. And Maybe some of it is viral persistence, but some of it might be an overactive um, immune system. So I think long COVID is going to be the legacy of COVID. Um, even today, people are still getting chronic symptoms, although there's some thought that the symptom duration for chronic symptoms is shorter. Um, uh, people are still getting it. Probably, I think the most recent estimates are about 7.5% um, right now after making progress, it's kind of stalled in, in that number. Um, and, and most people get better within a year, but it still represents a whole host of lost, um, you know, earning potential and disruptions to life. So when people call you, as I'm sure they do all the time and say, I have long COVID, what should I do? Do you, what do you tell them? Well, I think it's really tough. Um, if you live close to a uh, center that has a multimodal, like UCSF, this multidisciplinary approach, or if you're in a study 
uh, there are two things that happen. One is that you, um, like Lakshmi, uh, you know, uh, spearheads and others uh, center here at UCSF, you can get very specialized care based on your symptoms. So it's very symptom management. <laughs> Excuse me. And, um, or you can be part of a study like Recover, but those studies are pretty much uh, mainly saturated now. Uh, the, so you want to have symptom management. And the other thing is community. So a lot of long COVID started off because people got together online and they said, you know, I have these symptoms and it's long COVID. In fact, the National Association of Medicine purposefully didn't call it PASC or something biologic sounding. And they called it long COVID in homage to the patients who had these symptoms. So a lot of it is community support and symptom management. And, and not a lot of therapy, uh, except um, you know, physical therapy, uh, lung, th uh, pulmonary uh, management, et cetera. So when people press you on it, there's no drug that you recommend that they take, and you think the Paxovid study is convincing enough that you would not recommend that someone take a long course of Paxovid? Yes, at this point, I probably wouldn't recommend that they do Paxlovid uh, for 15-day course today. There are still ongoing studies with Paxlovid uh, for longer durations. Um, and as we get a better sense of the subgroups of long COVID, I think some of these therapies might end up being uh, beneficial. But right now it's a whole hodgepodge of people. And unfortunately, uh, you, know, I, you know, before COVID and the ID clinic, we saw people with chronic symptoms uh, after things like Giardia or, and then you'll get ir irritable bowel-like sy symptoms or, some random viral infection, and they would have very similar symptoms. Um, and at that point, you know, at UCSF, we'd refer them to OSHA oh, sure, for symptom management or um, just validate their symptoms. So I think, you know, as clinicians and in healthcare, validation is probably a really important thing and bearing witness to it, even if you don't have very specific therapy for people. Maybe one more question for you about the current state of Paxlovid in general for COVID. Do we know any more? Are you recommending it differently to people now than you would have a year or two ago? Yeah, so I think that we're evolved from recommending it to pretty much everyone who's diagnosed as positive to picking the lowest hanging fruit. There have been uh, you know, uh, at least a couple of studies now showing that there's little benefit in the generally well population, mainly because we have so much built up immunity now that the additional benefit of Paxlova is probably not that great, but in the, I think the biggest uh, population is say somebody who's older than 65, who didn't get a recent boost in last year, uh, I would definitely want to recommend that they take Paxlova or somebody who can't make uh, their own uh, antibodies to vaccination, like say somebody in uh, B cell depleting agents or somebody with a recent uh, transplant, older you get into drug interactions. I think Paxlovid in the future is probably going to um, go, you know, be supplanted by other alternative antivirals. Like um, there's one called Encytrelvir it, that's being um, uh, under FDA fast track now that's from Japan and it doesn't have the drug interactions of, of Paxlovid. Uh, and it's kind of like a time of flu where it shaves off a day, a day and a half of symptoms. So it's not that it would supplant Paxlovid where there's great data but it'll be an alternative agent. Then there are, there's at least one other that might be uh, impactful. But suffice it to say that there are still probably people who would benefit from Paxlovid. It's not everyone, but the people who would benefit, they're not getting it. Uh, in a recent VA study, looking at the mortality of COVID versus influenza, uh, when I looked at the, the number of vets who are getting Paxlovid, who are all eligible, um, it's only about 5% of the people. Okay. George, turning back to, uh, uh, to the influenza, you mentioned that people should get vaccinated. Is it the standard flu vaccine or does that need to be rejiggered around this new, uh, or I, I guess it's not even a new pathogen, it's been around for a little while, but do, do they, does the regular flu vaccine work? Probably not. Um, Probably not. But, you, but understand there are 36,000 deaths in the United States every year from seasonal influenza. So everybody, should be getting flu vaccine, period. Mm -hmm. okay, don't, don't misunderstand me. For H, so there are two neuraminidases associated with highly pathogenic avian influenza, H5 and H7. 
So this is H5N1 and it has, there was a, a death in Mexico earlier this week from H5N2, they reassort a lot. Um, and if we're gonna move into that brave new world of, of giving people as well as animals an, an H5 vaccine, we're gonna have to do it through cell culture because it kills eggs. At 80 percent of the influenza vaccine in the United States is grown in eggs, and they're and they're fertilized eggs too. They're not just you know pick them up at Costco. Um, you have to have fertilized eggs, and it's um, you know it's a pretty labor intensive thing. And the, oh, and by the way, you get two doses per egg. That's the other thing to remember. So if you want to vaccinate every chicken in China with eggs, you know, with a probably a 90 percent wastage rate, you got a lot of eggs to get. Okay. So they've moved in China, they've moved to cell-based cell vaccines. And I think with mRNA vac, you know, technology, we may be able to do something a lot better. We do have some cell-based vaccines. It's about 20% in the US, but it's, if we're gonna do it for H5N1, we're gonna have to figure out a way to keep the cells, keep the cell lines alive in order to, uh, to, raise, the, uh, to raise the organisms to then kill them so that we can then inject the antigen. So it's a tricky proposition. People are working on it right now. And, you, and the vaccines you're talking about are to inoculate the, to vaccinate the chickens or for the humans? Everybody. Every, well, so, everybody, so, everybody include chickens. So and I humans. would start, yeah, yeah you start <laughs> with chicken delight and move out from there. Yeah. Um, so I would start with dairy workers right now. Mm -hmm. People who work in these industries, this is an industrial problem, an occupational health problem right now. That's where you want to start because mm -hmm. that's going to be the kind of the first line. Um, and then you can go from there. If you decide you, you know, it's, it's economically feasible to, uh, to vaccinate chickens. Okay, fine. But chickens have a half-life of a month. What's the half-life of a chicken? So what's the half-life or a life expectancy? Well, same thing. Yeah. <laughs> this is epidemiology. <laughs> it's like 12 weeks. Okay. Chickens live you, for 12 weeks. Yeah. Cause they, cause they slaughter them. For, oh, well, for there's you, that. For you. <laughs> Got it. Not, you, that's not the it, natural it, life expectancy of a chicken. It ain't much more than that, believe All right. <laughs> um, unless there are layers and then they get coddled. But it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a big deal to do this mm -hmm. and it's a big expense. So, so if we, so the, the, the flu vaccine that we'll get in October will not be for this, not, this virus and you don't think not, it'll work very well Certainly for not it. to my knowledge. No, okay. It's not going to cross over very well. Yeah. And do you feel like the surveillance is accurate enough now that, that we'll know when it's breaking out in humans, that there's going to be more human, more transmission to humans, either I, human to human or mammal to other mammal to human? I think that, yeah, I think it's going to be, it's, it could be better, it could be tighter, um, but I think it's, you know, they're getting there, right? And the fact that they do big clusters around these individual cases to look for human to human transmission makes me feel better. Does the basic, maybe Deb, you know, so someone comes in to the clinic with conjunctivitis, are they getting tested for this? Oh yeah, for yeah, sure. They are today. Yeah. I that, mean, if they're yeah. dairy, if they're dairy workers. No, no, I'm Texas talking about probably. across the street. I'm not a no. dairy, dairy, you know, no, somebody who works not. downtown and comes in with conjunctivitis. Are we going to figure this out? No, we're not going to, they're not going to get, they're not going to get tested for it. I don't think. Deb, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, no, no, it's such a great question and, and a challenging one. I totally agree with George that right now it's really the, the, the folks that have exposures to animals that can be infected with H5N1. So that's that's mainly dairy farm workers, poultry farm workers. So uh, it is, I think, going to be important for clinicians to be thinking about this. So, that so we should be patients, asking about occupational exposures. So, yeah, you know, yes, especially in the summer months when people are coming in with influenza-like illness, when we're not seeing a lot of seasonal influenza, to think about asking them about animal exposures. Yeah. And, and ask them if they keep chickens in their backyard. And chickens. While well, you guys backyard, are sitting yeah. there saying, well, who would do that? It's, it's not at all uncommon. So. Totally, totally true. Yes, I don't have any chickens, but I know lots of people. They, they just chicken. don't have roosters because they make too much noise, but they're all the lay, they're heads, they lay eggs. Um, and, and if you suspect, then um, just make sure that you're contacting everybody who needs to know. That includes infection control and San Francisco Department of Public Health and the microbiology lab. It is an influenza A, so um, 
our diagnostic tests for influenza should be positive for influenza A. Mm -hmm. Not all of our platforms uh, do the subtyping, but our respiratory viral panels here do. So they will identify an influenza A as H1 or H3, the two regular, the usual seasonal influences. But if um, typing is not possible on that specimen, then that's a red flag to think about. So it doesn't identify the H5, but it will test, test positive for flu and then negative for the subtypes that we test for. That's yes. the clue that something funky might be going on. That's right. And our, our microbiology lab is, is going to actively be sending those specimens to the public health laboratory for additional testing. Okay. And does Tamiflu work for this? If they're giving it. What is that? Okay. <laughs> that's, that's not, that's not the question I asked. But do, do you not, do you not know, do we not know if it works? We, I think, I think there is evidence that it works. The, the viral sequences that have been looked at so far don't have any mutations that would suggest neuraminidase inhibitor resistance. So, and the, the four cases now in the U.S., I think they have all been treated with oseltamivir and Luckily, so far, the disease has been mild in those. They yeah, they didn't die there. of conjunctivitis. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Alison, I wanted to ask you, um, we're talking about general vaccine hesitancy and misinformation and all that kind of stuff. And there are now discussions of other outbreaks of childhood illnesses that went away for decades. And uh, do you have any thoughts about that and what the implications of, of the public attitudes about vaccines might mean for us? And we'll turn to George also after you're, you're done since... It's the only card-carrying pediatrician up here as well. Um, no, it's a major issue. I mean, I think it's been an, an issue for a while, you know, starting with Andrew Wakefield and this um, autism pseudo link, which was later disproven. Um, but, um, you know, I think we, we are seeing a resurgence of some vaccine preventable infections, measles, for example, 150 cases already this year, whereas in 2023, there were about 60 cases. Um, and uh, so I think measles, pertussis, other um, infections that maybe we don't, we're not used to thinking about or seeing a whole lot necessarily, at least as a adult docs, you can uh, let me know what you guys see on the feed side. But, you know, I think um, it's, it's, it's trickling over to the public in terms of vaccine um, hesitancy for, for um, a variety of, of infections. And, um, you know, I think We've been, um, the public's been really lucky, you know, before COVID, the threat of infectious diseases to a lot of people was sort of um, abstract because we were very lucky to live in a time where, you know, most kids don't get measles and we're not dying from infectious, um, you know, uh, diseases as much. But um, I think that unfortunately that may be something that, that we do start to see if enough people um, don't take their vaccines. Mm -hmm. Sure. There's a large deficit of measles vaccine around the world. It's something like 1.6 million doses. Kids who have not received a single dose from age plus 15, by the way. The kids who haven't received a single dose, and there's a big buildup of, of uh, susceptible people. And for those of us who are old enough, um, from 1988 to 1990, there were 18,000 cases of measles in California, which was a buildup of this cohort of kids, preschool, preschool kids, who went on to get it. Um, and they also, there was also outbreaks of congenital rubella syndrome buried in that because if you get MMR, right, you get measles, mumps, and rubella together. But I, but I would like, and, and so everybody knows about measles. Well, I've seen probably thousands of cases of measles, but you know, everybody knows about measles. It's a nasty thing to have as an adult, by the way. What you may not realize is that pertussis is a real issue. Pertussis fell about threefold um, during the COVID epidemic, mostly because people weren't mixing as much. And now it's come back up to, to the pre-epidemic level. So it's three times higher than it's been. It's, in, it's embedded. You can get D, T, uh, TD boosters, right? But you can also get DTAP. AP means a cellular pertussis vaccine. It's the one with many fewer complications. And so as people come, as you see your adult patients, make sure they get pertussis vaccine as well. It's something that's very, it's relatively preventable, but it's a nasty disease. And, you know, if you want to come up afterwards, I can do the pertussis cough for you, you know, followed by running off to vomit. You know, yeah. post-tuss of emesis is a huge big part of it. And they, you, they should get it if they haven't gotten it since childhood or when, yep. what's, okay. Yep. All right. We have... And anyone who will be in contact with infants, right? Right. Get me back. Right, right.
Uh, let's open it up to any questions or comments you have. Yeah, and say who you are. So Sorry, Angles, Texas is eight. Questions for the panel. I'm pretty scared about what, what the potential of the avian flu, a potential for an epidemic, if there are enough mutations that it could, it's going to jump quick, you know, fat, you know, well from from uh, cows uh, to humans. Uh, but how do you see that as playing out? What do you think we should be doing? I can start with that and then have others chime in. <clears throat> well, I share your concern that it probably the writing is on the wall. I think at some point it will become go into humans. Um, the last four and George will probably correct me with this, but the last four influenza uh, pandemics have all have avian flu uh, origins. But when I compare avian flu and where we are to where we were in COVID, I think we're ahead of the curve in some ways, um, which is we have a test, we have four drugs, uh, including Tamiflu, um, <clears throat> we have vaccines and the feds are actually uh, deployed 4.8 million vaccines already on the production line, um, other parts of Europe as well. And there are at least two candidate real vaccines. And then the mRNA people, Pfizer, Moderna, said that they, could, they can like tinker with it and make something in, in two months if needed. So we have the elements. The, the cause for concern right now for, for me and when H flu comes, you know, comes eventually um, uh, H5N1 comes eventually to humans is that, um, you know, we have so much politics infusing science now. We have people who are fed up. Uh, we have um, people who are not going to go back uh, to, I, I think Oklahoma had some law saying they're not going to follow any WHO policies. Um, so that is really the scary part. The fact that, which is some beneficial in some sense that public health is local, but also um, the CDC doesn't have a, you know, a, a arm where they can mandate things unless it's an emergency. So I think those are some of the mm -hmm. the pros and cons of where we're going. And yes, I think when it jumped from <clears throat> wild birds to sea lions, I think there were uh, several, you know, like a dozen mutations that happened. Uh, and I think that will continue. Anybody want to add anything? Yeah, sure. I'll I'll just add. Um... You know, looking even beyond H5N1 and sort of like the immediate um, future thinking large scale and, you know, if it's not H5N1, it'll be some other virus that mutates. And I think thinking um, in terms of big picture and problems that are really hard to solve, but things like factory farming, where you've got a lot of animals and people in close contact, um, it sort of makes it inevitable that you'll get new viruses mutating. And so, you know, a, a certainly a, a problem that's probably beyond the scope of, of the clinical environment, but I think just helpful to think about how we can be, you know, less reactionary in some ways and moving towards a, um, a future where we're not breeding these new infectious risks um, by nature of, um, you know, the, the foods that we're eating. Georgia, do you want to add something? No, I think Peter, Peter captured it. Yeah. Uh, other, yeah. You led by for the cardiology. So, I myself do not have chickens in my backyard, but my neighbor does. Mm. And while the clicking and clucking is kind of charming, <laughs> and I know that they raise designer chickens. I've seen them, these are spectacular birds. I think they raise them <laughs> to mate them and reproduce. But lately we've seen flies in our backyard. And I'm a little concerned. Uh, am I at risk? No, I would, I would say you're not. If they if they start to die and they call you to come and stuff to take them, <laughs> I would not do, do that. Any nuclear <laughs> cardiology studies on them, I would not do that. So we actually do have cases where for for uh, cockfighting, where people put the whole beak in their mouth and suck the blood out of their nostrils. Talk about you know that's a species crossover. Yeah, I don't care. <laughs> don't do that. All right, great. Any other uh, questions here? Let me see what we have online. Um, all right. A uh, question about other products that come from animals, for example, uh, raw meat or other kinds of things. Anything else that, that might be risky other than unpasteurized milk? I, I would say not. I mean, you know, we, ob we obviously have, you know, we don't want, we don't like people eating raw eggs. 
We don't eat like people cutting up chickens on the salad board and then cutting the salad up afterwards. We don't like you undercooking the dressing stuffed in the turkey. I mean, but those are all really about salmonella more than anything else. I mean, but the precautions that are in place should take care of pretty much everything, I, I would say. Okay. And then it's specifically, you know, raw, I mean, sorry, cook properly handled and cooked poultry is said to be safe. Okay. Deb, did you want to add okay. something? Deb, you just just to add that this is a really good example of the for what the one health approach is so important so it's public health working with veterinary scientists working with env environmental scientists i know the usda has been doing a lot of testing of, of beef um, and um, they have at least their results so far con confirmed that if you cook beef enough it should inactivate any um, h5n1 so, so there are plenty of folks thinking about um, other routes of transmission. There's been one case of a, a cow, but it wasn't destined, it wasn't a cattle, it was like a dairy cow that had uh, GH5N1 in the meat. But um, uh, I, again, it was a fragment and I think they tested it and it wasn't alive, but the, red, the risk is low and I, you know, I, I'm not changing my beef consumption um, for H5N1. I mean, and one might change it for other reasons, but yeah. yeah. And George, you've mentioned that sort of in the animals, it's it's fecal oral, and I, I guess I I wasn't I didn't understand that. I sort of thought flu was just was just respiratory, and you're saying that in some kinds of flu, it's not, and then if it mutates, it can become in a, in aquatic birds, it's transmitted through through fecal oral, uh, so they all go. The reason we have it here, and and why it's spread from Asia, is that all the ducks from or swans and geese. From Asia, fly north for the summer to Siberia and Alaska, and on the western flyway, all our ducks and geese fly north to these places, right? And they land in the same lakes, and there is fecal oral transmission in those. That's how these anim those animals get it, right? So what I'm saying is is that you know that's that's a, an established route of transmission. For human to human transmission, it's clearly respiratory, right? Mm -hmm. Nobody's nobody's saying anything else. Is there, but well, we is, don't know. What we we don't know what we don't know. Yeah, I mean, what is there something about the virus that's different, or something about why would a pathogen that in a human needs to find your nasal mucosa? And we always said, for example, you you're not going to get COVID from eating something. Uh, why would it be fecal oral in a given species and and respiratory in a different one? Or is that just too hard a question? We just don't know. Should I explain the anatomy of birds to you? No, not, <laughs> not, not in two minutes. But is that a, the anatomy of birds? Is yeah, different. It's just not? different. It's just different. They have different. Type, they have different tropism for different. You know, different cell types, and you know, it is what it is. All right, I'll, I'll buy that. Uh, Peter, there's a question online about uh, metformin and either co treating COVID or long COVID. Is there anything new on that? There have been some small studies looking at metformin, um, but I don't think it's trickled down into. Uh, practice yet i mean that the that it's beneficial uh, in 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 covid actually but <clears throat> uh it's low cost um etc but it you know there are other alternatives where i think um it hasn't really met you know been put into guidelines or anything like that so is there anybody today that you recommend metformin in and if they have acute if they have a case of COVID? No, I, I no. wouldn't at this point, although there's been at least one large study suggesting that it might work. And if they're over 65 and they can't take packs of it because of a drug interaction, let's say, what's your next choice? I would uh, think about three days of remdesivir if they're really going to be susceptible for serious disease, but they would have to be have access to an infusion clinic uh, for three once daily doses. But that is very you know, very effective um, the same level as Paxlovid, doesn't have drug interactions. And you actually have a seven day window period when the study showed it will have benefit as opposed to five days for Paxlovid. And maybe last question, anything new that we're, I know the guidelines changed about the period of isolation if you have COVID, uh, either Peter or Debbie or anybody wanna take on sort of what the current guidelines say and what you think is correct. This may not be the same thing. Um, so the guidelines are different for the public at large and, and for the healthcare setting. Um, I think the, th the thought about infectivity period has really changed a lot. Um, 
generally thought to be potentially infectious for 10 days following the onset of Hold, hold the mic a little closer. About 10 days following the onset of symptoms. You're saying the people think that now or think thought that? Have been thinking that for yeah. some time now. The changes to the public recommendations, again, it's the balance of benefits and, and risks in getting people to be able to go back and um, into public and work um, earlier than, than um, previous recommendations. In the healthcare setting, um, we are still, for example, isolating patients for for at least 10 days, most patients for 10 days, and could be longer for some immunocompromised patients. And for a healthcare worker who gets COVID, what's, what are the rules for them? So the current um, rules for that at UCSF Health are, um, if it's been at least five days, your symptoms are getting better, you've been afebrile for at least 24 hours without the use of the antipyretic agents, and if you do a COVID antigen test at that point and you're negative, you can come back to work. But the recommendation is to mask um, until you're out to that 10-day time period. Okay. You think that's reasonable? I guess you probably invented that. So, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I think it's reasonable. And again, it's it's everything is a balance. Yeah. But, any, uh, probably any, any other comments before we quit? Great. All right. Thank you all. A terrific session. And stay safe, everyone. Uh, enjoy the summer. Thank you.